a lot of questions been asked. <coughs> Whole sheaf of them. Some of them are letters in question and some very short questions. And we can't answer all of them, which would be impossible. It would take many, many days. And some questions have been chosen out of that lot. Before we go into these questions, We ought to talk over together. If we can ask a question from a state of mind or brain that is holistic, that sees, comprehends, or perception of the whole human problem, not just one particular problem, but all problems are related to each other. There is no one separate problem disassociated from the others. If that is so, then to ask a question or to face a problem from a, an integrated outlook. You understand? Most of us are fragmented, broken up. Business, religious, family life, sexual life, religious life, and so on and so on. We're all not a holistic, whole human beings, which is a fact. We look at life from a particular point of view, from a conclusion or from my, some idealistic concepts. These are all fragmented, fragmented outlook on life, right? We are talking things all together. And can we ask a, or face a problem from a wholly different outlook, which is not fragmented at all. You understand? Are we meeting each other in this? We just thought of it as we came across the lawn here. Whether we ask any question or face any problem holistically, I hope you don't mind using that word, though one has a so-called scientific word, but we can, I hope the scientists will forgive us if we use that word. From a point of total integration, integrity, and ask questions. It's rather interesting to go into it. Is it possible, recognizing that we are fragmented, broken up, divided in ourselves, contradictory, 
opposing one desire against another desire, and so on, knowing all that, being aware of all that, could we face a problem which is from a different focus? Why do we have problems? We've got so many problems, political, religious, sexual, and so on. We have multiple problems in life. And problems are increasing in a society that is so sophisticated, so complex, overpopulation, bad governments, and so on. And in the resolution of one problem, we seem to increase other problem, many other problems. Right? Why? In answering this question, that's going to raise it. The answer is going to awaken similar problems. Why do we have problems? And is it possible to meet a problem without a brain that is already conditioned to solve problems? Don't say my You don't understand. Let's, I, neither do I for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at it. We go to school very young, almost five or seven and so on, and we are children are faced with a problem, mathematical problem, how to write, how to read how to learn mathematics, you know, it becomes a problem. So from childhood, our brain is conditioned to solving problems, right? This is a fact. It's not some fantastic theory of the speaker. So one goes to college, there are again problems. And university, jobs, various functions, vocations, and so on. Problem after problem. Our brain is full of problems, right? And we're always seeking from a brain that is conditioned to solve problems. We're always seeking a solution to problems, right? Is this clear? We are together in this. Now, how can the brain solve problems if it is not free from problems? Right? Are we together a bit in this? Rather interesting question, this. Please let's go into this. Our brains are conditioned to the resolution of problems, solution of problems from childhood. And as the brain is conditioned to solve problems, it's always seeking a solution. And it's not understanding the problem itself, but the solution of the problem, right? Are we together a little bit in this? Yes? Good. And is it possible not to have a brain, to have a brain that is not conditioned to problems? You understand my question? 
I'm asking you, sirs and ladies, your brain is conditioned now to the solution of problems. And we have never solved the problems. They're increasing more and more and more. Why? Is it because a conditioned brain, which is embedded in problems, can ever solve problems? Right, you want to say? Have I put a question? Oh, come on. Is it possible to have a brain that is not conditioned to the solution of problems, but to the understanding of problems? Is there a difference between the solution of problems and the understanding of the problem? In the understanding of the problem, the solution may lie in the problem, not away from the problem. Right? Take a very ordinary example. We have never stopped wars. Human, human beings on this earth, since they have come on this earth, have had wars. And we have never solved the problem of war. <clears throat> but we try to reorganize how to kill man better. And this reorganization, how to kill man better, is called progress. <laughs> I don't know if you're following all this. This is not a joke. So we move from organization to organization. We had first the League of Nations, and now we have the United Nations, but wars go on. They have different organization. You know? So we move from one organization to another, hoping thereby to solve problems and multiply problems. So we never stop wars. And the cause of war is nationalism, economic division, local division, and so on, so on, so on. Division. Linguistic, racial, religious, economic, cultural, and so on. These divide man. We're all human beings. We all suffer. We all have pain and anxiety and boredom, loneliness, despair. We don't tackle that. But we want to solve the problems that, is, that seems to have an external causes. <coughs> right? So um, we are asking, can the brain Recognizing, seeing that it is conditioned to the solution of problems from childhood, be free of it, and then face problems. Right? Right, sir? Will you do it? <laughs> that is the question. to be conscious, to be aware that our brain, that we, as human beings, from the beginning of life, we're always struggling with problems and trying to find the right answer to them. The right answer can only be when we recognize the brain is conditioned 
And as long as that brain is conditioned to solving problems, we will never find the right answer. Are you clear? So, do I recognize that fact? Not the idea, but the fact. There is a difference between idea and the fact, right? I hear this statement, and from that statement I draw a conclusion, quite right, must it so, and from that uh, statement I abstract an idea of it, and then pursue the idea, not the fact that my brain is conditioned to solve problems. That's the fact. Not that I should be free of this conditioning. That's not fact. Are you understand? So, the brain is conditioned. And as long as that condition exists, multiplications of problems will go on, Reorganization of the problems will go on, and changing from one capitalist society to totalitarian society, or this or that, will always be bring about enormous problems. Right? Will can you and I be free of of the brain that is conditioned? That is to be aware of it and see the depth of it, the truth of it, the logic, the sanity, the reason of it, and not move away from that. Not find some abstract explanations. Right. Is this all right? I'm asking if it's all right, perhaps it's all wrong. <laughs> no, it's not all wrong. This is a fact. If one cannot get on with one's wife, quarrels, contention, and all the rest of it, and a divorce, one divorces, then go to choose another person and keep on repeating this, right? If one has the money <laughs> and if one has plenty of time and energy. This is the game that's going on in the world on a small or a bigger scale. But the problem is not divorce or on all this complications of relationship, but to understand the depth of relationship, the meaning of relationship. The, un, the relationship, as we pointed out, is one of the most important things in life. Not the emotional expressions of it, the tantrums, the neuroticism of relationship, but what is important, significant, depth in relationship. And we never ask that question. We want to solve the problem of relationship. You understand? And so we never solved them. The psychiatrists, psychotherapists, and so on and so on are multiplying in the world like mushrooms. And they're not solving problems. They're not solving the depth of all this. So we should Consider together 
What is the art of living? You understand? Oh, come on, sir. It's a nice morning. Are you saying that if we have a system for solving problems, then every time we approach a problem, we use our system That's instead right. of understanding? That's right. Lady is saying, if we have a system, a pattern of solving a problem, then the system is not is operating, not the understanding and the depth of the problem. Right? The same thing. We were talking about the art of living. Sorry, these are the questions, but there it is. You don't mind? We'll, we'll come to that. There are many of them, so we've chosen six of them. That will be enough for this morning. But we are asking, what is the art of living? We have the art of poetry, painting, the art of so many, art of cooking, especially now, <laughs> and so on. But we never asked ourselves, perhaps which is the greatest art, what is the art of living? Is there an art? Or is it all the chance? Or is it all some genes? A, a biological chances and so on. What is the true art of living? Are you waiting for me to answer it? <laughs> if one answers it, don't make a problem of it. <laughs> then, it, then the art is thrown out of the window. So let's look at it together to find out what is the art of living. Art in the widest and the depth of that word, not just the, all the contents of a museum. If you were asked that question, what is the art of living? What would be your answer? Not calculated answer, personal answer, or emotional romantic answer, which are meaningless. Right? If I answer that question emotionally, oh, it is the most. Our art of living is the highest aspiration, <laughs> which is sheer nonsense. Art of living is the most exalted intellectual activity, right? That's only very partial. Or art of living is to have a holistic outlook on life. Sounds excellent. But factually it isn't. So what is the art of living? Obviously, no conflict whatsoever. Right? A brain that is in conflict all the time having problems all the time. This tremendous self-concern. Such a brain must inevitably be limited, right? If one is thinking about oneself, 
how to meditate, whether you can, all the rest of it. Your, your, merit, your very meditation is self-centeredness. So, the art of living, it appears, you can add to it more, to live without conflict. Is that possible at all? That is to understand the opposing elements in one's life. Right? Desiring one thing, opposed to that desire another thing. You know, this corridor of dualities. And this self-centeredness, as long as that self-centeredness exists, there must be conflict, because self-centeredness is limited, small, petty. But you listen to all this, but carry on. Right? And you say that it's not possible in modern society to live without self-centeredness, at least a little bit of it. <laughs> have you ever tried, have you ever done, lived without self-centeredness for one day? Not to think about oneself. Just even for an hour. <laughs> and see what happens. You haven't committed to anything. You can go back to your selfish self centeredness. <laughs> Nobody's going to say how wrong it is or right it is. That's the normal state of human beings, apparently. So if one really tries for an hour, actually do it, not try it, do it and see what happens. <coughs> and if you do it one hour, you can extend it. <laughs> and you, you don't, re it gives you tremendous energy. It gives you great sense of passion. Not lust and all the business, but the passion to pursue something profoundly to the very end of things. Right. Is that enough for this? You better come back. I haven't read these questions. First, I'm, this is the first time I'm looking at them. So you're also looking at them for the first time. What is attention if it has nothing to do with thought? Is it an activity of the brain? Is it a physical process? How does it come into being? You see, we cannot bring about attention by an act of will. What must one not do in order to allow attention to exist? Do nothing. Sorry, I must answer it. <laughs> what is... <laughs> what is attention? If it, is not, if it has nothing to do with thought, is it an activity of the brain? Is it a physical process? How does it come into being? You say we cannot bring about attention by an act of will. What must one not do in order to allow 
attention to come into being. Right? You've got the question. He's asking, what is attention? Is it a physical act? Is it the movement of thought? Is it an action of desire, which is the essence of will? Desire is the essence of will, right? How does this attention come about? Which is, can it come naturally? easily, without making tremendous effort going to colleges or attending some guru, being trained, can it all come about, this attention naturally? We're going to talk over together, right? We're going to look at the question, not the answer. The question is, what is attention? In which is implied not only the hearing of the ear, but hearing without the ear. You understand? And also attention implies seeing, perceiving. Seeing visually, but also seeing with the inner eye, as it were, right? And attention also means learning, right? Agree? Seeing, hearing, and learning. Those three things are implied, which means, what is learning? Is it memorising? You are following me? Somebody say yes. I don't want to go on not talking to myself. So is it memorising, as we do, we're going to go to school, college, university, memorising, storing up knowledge from books, from professors, from teachers, from housemasters, uh, and so on, so on, which is always accumulating as knowledge and using that knowledge skillfully or not, right? Carpenter, uh, an apprentice to a master carpenter, is learning the nature of the wood, what kind of wood, the grain, the beauty of the wood, the feeling of the wood, and, gra- and the instruments which he's employing, and so on. He's learning. And that learning is through experience, day after day, month after month, accumulating knowledge about carpentry, making a master cab- cabinet maker. Right? That's what we call learning. That kind of learning is limited. Obviously, because all knowledge is limited now, or in the past, or in the future, right? Because all the scientists, biologists, etc., and so on, are lear- accumulating. They killed a man with an arrow or a club at the beginning of time. Now you can blast the whole of millions and millions of human beings with one blow. That's a tremendous accumulation of knowledge to do that, for good or for bad. So, and that knowledge 
is always limited. Right? So he's there and learning, which is not limited. Fun, go on. I'm just discovering something myself. <laughs> is there a learning that is not the, an accumulated process of knowledge? Learning. In which is implied hearing not only the words, the significance of the words, your reactions to the words, your responses to certain um, favorite words, like love and hate and you know all the rest of it. And also seeing without any prejudice. Seeing without the world. You understand? Can you look at a tree without the world? You understand? Have you ever done all this? That means seeing without direction, without motive, without any network of thought or blocking the seeing. And learning, which is a, a, pro, a limitless process. So attention implies all that. Plus, or the beginning of it, is to be aware. Right? Or we are aware, as we sit here, the extent of this tent The, in the, the great number of people accumulated here, and the number of posts along there. <laughs> and to look at all that without a single word, to be aware. But in that awareness, you begin to choose. I like that blue shirt better than what I'm wearing. Right? I like that the way that your hair is done better than mine. Right? You're always comparing, judging, evaluating, which is choice, and to be aware without choice. You understand? Will you, as we are talking, will you do all this? Or you are just listening to words? If we are doing this, then you begin to discover awareness is entirely different from concentration. Concentration implies Focusing all thought on a particular subject, on a particular page, on a particular word, which implies cutting off all other thoughts, building a, a resistance to every other thought, which then becomes narrow, limited. Right? So concentration is limited. But you have to concentrate when you are doing something, washing dishes. You have to wash the dishes very carefully. Right kind of soap, right kind of water, you know, all this. And awareness without choice which means without concentration. To be aware of all this without judging, evaluating, condemning, comparing. And from that move, which is attention. Right? 
which is natural. That is, I want to listen to this story you're telling me. Very exciting thriller. And I listen to you very carefully. Or you're telling me something very, very serious. And I pay, I'm, I'm so eager, so at, attentive to understand what you're saying. I understand what I'm thinking about, that's irrelevant. But I'm tremendously concerned with what you are saying. Therefore, I'm all attention, all my nerves, my whole being say, what are you talking about? I want to understand. In that attention, there is no me, right? I don't get it? When, I, when there is this tremendous attention, which means all your energy is given to understand what you are saying, I am not thinking about myself. Therefore, there is no centre in me that says, I must attain. Right? I want to figure it out. Come on. What's that? There are right questions. That's the right. What's the right question here? The gentleman asks, if I understand rightly. Sorry, if you ask questions from the audience, we can never get through this. <laughs> Not that we must get through it, but it's, there are too many people. If you don't mind. What is the right question here, and what is the right answer? If it is a right question, you will never ask it. <laughs> now, this is not just cleverness. A right question, if you put it, you have the answer. But the right question, is doesn't is not put because you want an answer, you are concerned, you are worried, you are biased, you follow? So the right question when you put it, the right question is the right answer. May we go on to the next question? If the whole of life is one movement with its own order, why is man so disorderly? If the whole of life is one movement with its own order, why is man so disorderly? Why do we assume that whole of life is one movement with its own order? You first state a fact, it's supposed to be a fact, and then try to say, why is there a disorder? You understand? First you assume, one assumes, that life is a, a vast movement. And in that vast movement, that very movement is order. You state that first. If, and then you say, why is man so disorderly? Right? You understand? Wouldn't it be the right question to ask, why is man disorderly? Not assume that life is perfect order. Right? The fact is, we live disorderly. Why? That's the question. Why do we live disorderly? What is disorder? What is disorder to you? Disorder is the activity of thought which is in itself limited. 
right? Whatever the limited activity of thought does, it will bring about disorder. Because thought in itself is limited. Because thought is born of knowledge, and knowledge is limited. Right? This is not epigram- epigrammatical statement. What is I must I was too quick. Right. What is what is order and what is disorder? How will you find order? Is order a definite pattern which you which you have set, which thought has set? Say I must get up at six o'clock in the morning, do this, 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 and go to the office or factory or do is that a determined, planned, day after day, is that order? So we must first ask not what is order, but what is the cause of disorder. Agree? What is the cause of disorder in our life? First of all, we must admit, whether we like it or not, that we live a very, very disordered life. That's a fact, isn't it? Would you agree to that one thing at least? No. No? What is disorder? There's a lack of order. And then you have to ask, if it's lack of order, then it's what is order? How can a mind, brain, which is so disorderly, find out what is order? Why don't, why don't we be a little bit logical, rational, though Reason, logic are limited. We must begin with that and then go beyond it. But if we say, no, the order is this, then it becomes military. Right? It becomes a tremendous discipline. Agree? So this is also simple. All right. So, we have to go into this carefully. First, let's inquire what is discipline? The soldiers are trained day after day, month after month. Have you seen them? The beating of the drum, and the sergeant, and all that order, discipline, obey. And the obedience to an abbot, to a pope, to a, and so on, is called order. There is order according to the policeman. In Europe, you drive on the right hand side. In this country, you drive on the left hand side. That's order. And the man who is used to driving on the left hand side goes over there and says, That is disorder. <laughs> Follow all this, please. So, what is cause of disorder? What is, if I can understand that and be free of that cause, there is naturally order. I don't have to find out what is order. So I have to first inquire why 
this enormous importance given to discipline in the schools, in the whole way of life. What is discipline? <coughs> the word discipline comes from the root disciple. A disciple is one who is learning from the master. Learning. Right? If we are learning in the sense we are talking about, not accumulating knowledge, but learning, without accumulation, then discipline, the very learning is its own discipline. You understand? I wonder if you understand. Uh-huh. Hmm. I still don't understand what learning is, because if one watches one's thought, surely one's watching with one's thought. Yes. So uh. I don't quite understand how you use learning. I've tried to explain it myself, but shall I go into it again? First of all, are we aware or do we see the fact accumulating knowledge all our life is very limited? That's a fact, because knowledge is limited. Whether now or in eternal future is still limited. And therefore, if we act on that knowledge, our action will always be limited. And therefore, that is one of the causes of disorder. Right? If I act always with the previous knowledge which I have accumulated, and I know that knowledge is limited, and whatever I do is limited, and any limitation must produce disorder. That is, the Arab and the Jew, the Hindu and the Muslim, the Buddhist and the Catholic, you follow? They are all limited. They are all functioning within the field of knowledge which is limited, or tradition. Right? We are following all this. So their activity of limited activity is bound to create disorder. If the wife or the husband or the girl or the boy is thinking about himself, his ambitions, his progress, his fulfilment, and the other man or the woman is also thinking his pro right? They are in conflict, obviously. They may talk about love, they may talk about all kinds of things, but it, each man, each woman and man is pursuing his own particular direction his own ambition, which is all very self-centred, limited. Right? And so in the relationship, that limitation creates disorder, naturally. Are we meeting this? So we are beginning to discover the disorder comes where there is limitation. Right? where I am thinking about myself, and you are thinking about yourself. And we have a lovely relationship. We hold hands, we sleep together, we walk together, look at but we both are going in different directions. Right? And therefore, those directions are designed by thought, by desire. Is it time to go into desire here now? No, it's too complicated. We'll return. So we begin to learn to see, to have an insight. And we are using the word insight, which is to observe something without time, without motive. To have an insight is not 
remembering, calculating, and so on. It is to have instant insight into disorder, which is ultimately any limited action. Are we getting together on this? Little bit, fraction. And if it is fraction, keep it and move with it. Then you will see the thing begins to break up this self centered process of living. May I ask you a question? Are you, all of us here, are we putting equal energy as the speaker is putting? <laughs> Or are you just sitting, listening, listening to the aeroplane and listening to your own thoughts going on? Or you are, you understand, passionate to find out? How can our listening be adequate? to the depth of what you are saying. What is the quality of mind that will allow the fullness of what you are saying to act in us? I'm afraid that's a wrong question, but I'll read it. How can our <coughs> listening be adequate to the depths of what you are saying? What is the quality of mind that will allow the fullness of what you are saying to act in us. The speaker is saying something which you haven't, you yourself have not discovered. He is not talking about what he has discovered. That's totally irrelevant. But the words, what the telephone is saying, what the words, the content of the words, all that you are listening to. And the listening is watching your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own reactions, right? The speaker is merely acting as a mirror in which you, you by listening, you are discovering yourself. Saye? You understand what I'm saying? The speaker, as a person, as he has oft repeated, has no importance whatsoever. And he means this. And what he is saying is not something that is foreign, that's, that you have to understand, that has to act upon you. Then, if that is so, something foreign which must act upon you, you might just well take a drug. But if you are listening, to what he is saying, and saying, what do I feel to what he is saying? What is my reaction to what he is saying? You follow? There is a communication between what he is saying and yourself. Right? Communication ceases when you are merely listening to what he is saying. But if what he is saying and your relationship to what he's saying, and to discover your reaction to what he's saying, and your responses to his uh, subtleties or stupidities or intelligence, if you are then 
moving together. It, then it's yours, not his. I wonder if you understand. Please, please, ma'am. Just I understand. Take a little time with what I'm saying. Don't me if I may ask most politely. Don't immediately answer, but see what he's saying. First of all, he says he's not your guru. Absolutely not. That's an anathema to him. And you're not his followers. Right? And you haven't got to live what he's talking about. What he's saying is what your own deep, undiscovered, Life. That's all, right? He is talking about you, not himself. <coughs> he is talking about your life, your daily monotonous, boring, tiresome, fearful, sorrowful, lonely life. The violence, the chicanery, the dishonesty, the lack of integrity. <coughs> Where there is integrity, there is strength. But that is another matter. Then you can stand by yourself. Then nothing affects. Then you are not influenced by anybody, because you are then discovering what is true for yourself, not according to truth according to you or according to somebody else. Truth, which is not his or yours, it is something entirely not outside the activity of brain. I won't go into that for the moment. So, We are, we are together finding what is true. We are together finding out what is the art of living, what is the way to listen, what is the way to learn, what is the way of seeing. And if you see, it is yours. Then you need no guru, no leader, no book. You understand? We are living on other people's knowledge. We have no insight into our, ourselves, into our own existence. Right? Can I go on to the next question? How is, is there such a thing as good or evil in the world? I'm sorry, I must read again. Is there such a thing as good or evil in the world, or are these human concepts, values, projections? Is there such a thing as good or and evil in the world, or are these human concepts, values, and suppositions and pro projections? What is good? And what is so called not good? If we use the word evil that has got such connotations behind that word, let us forget the word evil for the moment. The good and the bad. The baddies and the goodies. <laughs> according to the cinema. <laughs> what is good? No. 
please try look at it for a minute. I'm, the speaker is asking the question, what is good? How do you listen to the word? How do you receive that word? Doesn't matter who says it. How do you listen to it, receive it? What's your taste of that word? What's your feeling, instinctive feeling to that word? Instinct. I don't mean <coughs> generally. Your immediate feeling for that word. And when you say the bad, what is your response to it? A repulsion? A thing that you see some evil, some bad thing being done? So to discover for oneself the reaction to these two words. Not what philosophers say, not what other people, the, the bishops, the priests, the popes, the popes, I don't mean merely the Roman Pope, but the popes of all over the world, of different religious organizations with their heads, with their tails and all the rest of it. When one listens to these two words which have had tremendous effect on mankind, historically, right from the beginning. The Christians have said, this is good. If you go against it, we'll burn you. They have. Heretics tortured them, burnt them, for oh, what they have done. And that's considered good. And Go to India to be burnt for some of your belief is considered a horror. You understand? So what is good, apart from all this, what is good and what is bad? Now, I'll go on. May I? Is the good related to the bad? And is the good in conflict with the bad? Novels are written about it. The good always conquering at the end. Even in the thrillers. And the bad is always being destroyed. And the bad always coming up. The battle has been going on. You see it in Lesco and other caves in south of France and other parts of the world, this battle, right? Good and the bad, the evil. I, I don't like that word evil. It's, it stinks. <laughs> Forgive me if I use that word. Sorry. <laughs> So what is good and what is bad? Are they related to each other? Is goodness born out of that which is bad? Because I know that which is bad, tradition, conditioning, that which has people have said, written, and that evil, that bad, that which is bad, is fighting that which is good. And the good is fighting the, that which is bad, right? So I'm asking, is the, that which is good born out of that which is bad? You understand my question? It's a simple question. If goodness is born out of that which is bad, it is not good. Right? 
then they are related to each other. Therefore, it's not good. Are you following? So, there are two entirely different things. The one cannot become the other. If it can become the other, it is already recognised by the other. You understand all this? Therefore, it is not good. Goodness is something totally divorced from the, that which is bad. Right? But we have mixed the two together and, and we say we must fight it, each thing must be fought. You must resist, fight, put away evil, bad, in order to be good. You understand? So the goodness is always in terms of the bad. And we are saying something entirely different. Goodness has no relationship whatsoever with that which is bad. For the goodness to exist, the bad must cease. That's all. Not a battle between the two. This is simply logic, sanity. Now, to come very near home, in us there is these two opposing elements, this duality. Duality of wanting, I won't. I don't like. Sorry, aspiration is a wrong word. Aspiration is something romantic and idealistic and rather stupid. Forgive me if I use that word. We're all aspiring for something. You're aspiring to become a manager of a good corporation, and you're also aspiring. For God, same thing. Whether you understand, this God is another form of good cooperation. <laughs> I'm not being blasph- blasphemous, but these are all so obvious. So goodness cannot exist where that which is bad. From the bad you cannot possibly go to the good. It's not a movement from this to that. It's not a process of time from that which is bad to achieve that is good. Right? Now, the question arises from that. What is bad? You understand? I will know what is good only when the, that which is bad is not. So I let's put away the good. Don't let us say, tell me what it is secretly or tell me openly, <laughs> then I'll follow that. But to understand what it, that which is bad. Is it bad to be a nationalistic? Come on, says, answer it. <coughs> to say I'm a Frenchman, I, I'm British, or a, I'm a Hindu, or a Sikh, or a Muslim. You know, is that bad? It might not be to yourself, but to other people. Of course, to other people, we are including all of us. So I'm not saying. To me it's bad and to you it's not bad, that's rather... We are asking what is bad, not according to me or according to somebody else. As long as there is division, right? 
racial division, class division, religious division, right? Political, economic, and so on divisions. Those divisions create conflict, war ultimately, killing each other. You understand? Isn't that bad? Yes. No? Yes. yes. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> and yet, religions have supported it. You support it. You understand? They say, you know, all the rest of it. Can we be free of all that first? Not belong to any country, to any group. To any guru, to any religious organization, because they are all divisive. That brings about another question authority, political authority, religious authority, the totalitarian authority. Is authority evil? Not authority in the hands of the wise is good. Do you understand? We have said that authority of the wise is the salvation of the foolish. <laughs> so authority of the policeman, the authority of law. You have to pay tax, not for myself, but <laughs> you have to pay tax. If you don't pay it, you go to, you are, you are punished for somewhere or other. So there is authority, Outwardly, right? Authority of keeping to the left side of the road, the authority of keeping right side in France and Europe. And there must be authority in a school, in a college, otherwise you go, you follow? But we are talking about authority, the feeling of authority, the power of authority. to slaughter people. So authority, spiritual, authority in the deepest sense of that word is bad, is, is evil. So then the question is, the bad. The bad, we said, is any kind of division. Don't misunderstand. The religious division, right? The division that says, we are closed, you can't come in here, psychologically. But the door is open if you want to come in. That's not. You understand? That's not closed. So go into all this. It all comes down to any form of psychological, individualistic division. The Arab, the Jew, the Muslim, the, and so on. Any psychological, organizational division in that sense of that word. That's bad. Right? And can one be free of all that? And not just say, yes, I agree, I see your point, but it's all right, but go on with our war. It's nice. 
We are violent people. That's part of our expression of violence, the ultimate expression of violence, to kill a million people at one blow. Or do we end all that in ourselves? In ourselves first, not organisationally. You know that story which I which the speaker thought out? There are two men walking along. You know, if some of you heard this, if you have forgiven me, don't get bored with it. Two men were walking along on a street, talking about various things of life. And one of them sees something on the pavement, picks it up. The moment he looks at it, his whole face changes. He's some, something tremendously had taken place in him. And he puts it in his pocket very carefully, in his inner pocket. And the friend says to him, what is it you picked up? What is, why have you become so extraordinary? Your face has changed. He said, I picked up truth. And the fellow and his friend says, but you, is that really so? I can see by how you look. So what shall we do about it? And the French said, let's go and organise it. <laughs> this is an old story, nurse, which I speak in bed about 40 years, 50 years ago. So, can we, each one of us, not join an organisation that will help us to be free from war, That's another form of org, you follow? We don't begin with ourselves first. Can we, each of us, end this division in ourselves? Then you can use organizations, you understand? But if you use organizations to change the inner, you never succeed. So, can we? Each of us put anything that divides us from another. Of course, you must have your own house, your own garden, your own. You follow me, not psychologically, inwardly, subjectively. Then you don't have to search for the good. Then the good flourishes. Then goodness flowers. And the beauty of that is endless. It never can be destroyed by anything. Sorry, I have to stop now. What, sir? Of course not. The tiger kills the beautiful deer. And the tiger too is very beautiful. Have you been very close to a tiger in Africa? No, of course not. <laughs> You've seen them in a zoo. <laughs> Be very close, about 10 feet away from them. I don't bother. I'm not inviting you to go and meet them. The tiger eats the deer. The, li the big things eat the little things. And the bigger th things eat the bigger. Follow? Up and up. Is that evil? Tiger killing the deer? Of course not. It's, that's, you follow? That's nature. Why do we say tiger is cruel? The cat playing with a mouse. You understand? Haven't you known that? That's rather ugly. It's, you know, that's... Our whole civilization is so monstrous, right? 
So we must begin with ourselves, not tiger, elephants and rats and snakes. I'm afraid we all do this. We want to escape from ourselves. And ourselves is the most important thing. And to penetrate this sheath, this outward appearances, outward show, outward thing, deeply to go inward. That journey is endless. It has got such extraordinary beauty. We'll stop now. We'll go into another.